This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about Bitcoin and your altcoins. And the message of this video is that your altcoin is dying, son. Your dog coin is getting old in dog years, and it's going to need to be put down soon, unfortunately. But don't worry, this is just part of the circle of life in crypto land, as we learned in The Lion King, and as we learned from Do Kwan in this video that he made just a couple days before luna imploded he said 95 percent of coins are going to die but there's also entertainment in watching companies die too very ironic given what happened to terra luna shortly after this i think he got the percentage wrong though i think this this 95 percent is more like 99.999 uh, percent when you look at how many altcoins there are out there and how many are actually going to survive unfortunately there's been a lot of collateral damage in altcoin land in this bear market mostly to unsophisticated retail investors who didn't realize that they were the fools at the poker table. During the bull market, I tried to warn these people repeatedly. I made a lot of videos like this, and many times after I made a video like this, a lot of billionaire VCs are laughing at you. You can look in the comments and see people saying, well, I'm gonna buy even more Solana uh, because of this. I also made a video about Terra Luna and uh, its buying Bitcoin and what this could mean for the stability of its, of its stable coin. And I got a comment, a very sad comment uh, down here from Scar Sizzle. You can say what you want about Luna or ETH, but they have been outperforming Bitcoin by much, much more percentage wise. Not everyone is already rich like you. We know these are risky outs to get into, but I, but I also like to actually make money. This is the problem with thinking that short term outperformance, outperformance or short term correlation means anything at, at all. And he was definitely right about this. You can see uh, this in this chart, if it's going up, that means that Terra Luna is outperforming Bitcoin. If it's going down, it means Bitcoin is strengthening against Terra Luna. And when I made that video and when he made that comment, this was certainly true. But unfortunately, this is what happened next. In Bitcoin terms, in dollar terms, in almost all terms, Terra Luna has, has gone to zero. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. This is the thing about new coins and new cryptocurrencies. They outperform Bitcoin until they don't. Most are mean reverting when denominated in Bitcoin. And I think ultimately all of them are mean reverting when denominated in Bitcoin. So I'll show you a few charts here where Bitcoin's in the denominator and the altcoin is in the numerator. This is Cardano versus Bitcoin. Again, when it's going this way, it means Cardano is outperforming. This is what normally happens when you have an ICO and it just gets started. But then you never again see those same highs. So even in the next bull market, you get a lower, uh, a lower high. And we can see that Cardano probably has a long way to go down uh, from, from here denominated Bitcoin terms. Same for XRP, completely dead in the water for years and years and years with these spikes that that just really serve to hurt retail investors who think that uh, XRP is the next shiny new thing, even though it has this mean reverting property like all altcoins. Same with Solana. Solana had very nice outperformance in 2020 and 2021. It's all now mean reverting. And it could get very ugly if we get back down to these levels in terms of Bitcoin. This means that Solana has a very, very long way to go down from here. Likewise with Litecoin, this is a coin that's been around really since uh, 2013, 2014, and we can see the same pattern of lower, uh, lower highs trending all the way down to zero. Litecoin, of course, was a, I believe it was a fork of Bitcoin. Even Ethereum here has never seen the same uh, FX highs or the same highs in terms of Bitcoin that it did back in 2017. And we've been uh, mean reverting, especially over the last uh, over the last couple of days. We could break to much much lower levels. This could be what the transition to proof of stake looks like, where it really is in the the nail in the coffin in terms of Ethereum's security and stability. But either way, we can see that Ethereum is, has uh, never been able to retake these these highs when denominated in Bitcoin. Finally, you can't even fork. Bitcoin. We saw what happened with Litecoin. This is Bcash, Bitcoin Cash, which is a fork of Bitcoin back from the fork wars of 2017 and 2018. And it's basically gone to zero in Bitcoin terms. It's just been a complete disaster. And this serves as a warning sign to those who want to fork Bitcoin 
this is what happens. You can probably enrich yourself forking Bitcoin, or at least you could back back in the day. But it's very, very bad for people who follow you into that. And you're probably going to be dumping on them the whole time. So it's not exactly an ethical thing to do. It's important to have this sort of historical uh, perspective. And I think one nice way of doing this is if we go to CoinMarket and we look at their historical data, they have snapshots back from 2013 and uh, all the way up, all the way up to the present. If we take a look at their first snapshot, this was from the 28th of April, 2013. And the first thing I would, I would point out is that the only two names that I really recognize in here, uh, the others sound a, a tiny bit familiar, but of course, Bitcoin is number one, as it always is. Here's Litecoin, which is still around. And then you have all these coins that you've probably never heard of, Peercoin, Namecoin, Terracoin, Devcoin, and Novacoin. And the only way you've heard of these is probably if you were around back in, in these days in crypto, which was before my time. So this is one lesson that the top 10 names out of the top 10 names, or in this case, the top seven names, most of them will be completely different in a few years from uh, moving moving forward from there. And this means that if you hodl one of these other coins instead of hodling Bitcoin, you will get in trouble. The other lesson from this, of course, is that daily outperformance, hourly outperformance, weekly outperformance doesn't matter. Here is Novacoin massively outperforming Bitcoin over the last hour up 2%. Back in 2013, when Bitcoin was only up 0.64%, of course, what happened to Novacoin since then is it's now trading at three cents, down from four dollars and 25 cents. Now, Litecoin is still around. You can see Litecoin back here was only trading at four dollars and 35 cents. Of course, Bitcoin was at 134 dollars per Bitcoin. So we could say that Litecoin, Litecoin did have good performance from here. Litecoin is up. 16x in US dollar terms, but over the same time period to today from the 28th of April 2013 to today, or really uh, to roughly last night, Bitcoin is up 222x in US dollar terms. So even in the case, if you get lucky and you pick one of these coins, these top 10 coins and they survive, they almost always massively underperform underperform Bitcoin. And this is this is why it's so important to measure your returns in Bitcoin, because if you're not outperforming Bitcoin and you're doing all these complex trading, trading strategies and paying all these taxes, it might make more sense just to hold the hardest money of all time, which destroys everything in its path. So again, we can look here, see the top seven names, and then we can look at the top seven names. Right now we have uh, BTC, Ethereum, Tether. It's sort of silly to count stable coins here since they're, they're pegged to the dollar. Um, but we have another stable coin here, USDC, XRP, Cardano, Solana, and Dogecoin. Those are the, the, the top 10. And if we fast forward in, uh, and look at this in two or three years from now, you can be certain that the top 10 names will contain many different tickers than are there today. But Bitcoin will still be at the top there outperforming everything else. So we can see Litecoin went from $4 to $68, but still only up 16x in, in US dollar terms, while Bitcoin is up 222x in US dollar terms. And it's not just your altcoin that's dying when it's denominated in Bitcoin. It's really every other asset class in the world. If you've been owning, owning Bitcoin over the past few years, houses keep getting cheap cheaper from your perspective, groceries and gas keep getting cheaper, and stocks keep getting cheaper as well. And this will be surprising to that latter point will be surprising to a lot of people who still seem to think that Bitcoin is just a tech stock because it's it's been very short term correlated with tech stocks for the past couple years. But if we take a look at at the QQQs, which is a nice basket ETF of of tech stocks, including all the FANG stocks, this is uh, the QQQ denominated in Bitcoin. And if, and if we zoom out, we can see it's been a very ugly story for tech stocks as well. And the way I like to explain this is that short-term correlations tell you nothing about long-term returns. So for example, back in 1999 and early 2000, Pets.com and Amazon were competitors and they were highly correlated in terms of their day-to-day -day movements. Of course, one of them went bankrupt. The other one went on to become a multi-trillion dollar company. So short-term correlations don't tell you anything about long-term returns. And if these assets are quite different, which they are indeed, pets.com was very different from Amazon and the QQQs are very different from BTC, they should have different long-term returns, which is really what has happened. So what makes Bitcoin so special and interesting and why do I focus on it so much? 
and why do I choose to denominate all these charts in Bitcoin? Bitcoin had a very interesting conception and birth. It had what I call an immaculate conception. It was started before everyone knew how, to, how the game worked. And then its founder, Satoshi Nakamoto, left very early on. So there wouldn't be this central point of failure having a, a founder present as you have with Cardano, you have Hoskinson, and with Ethereum, you have, Vital you have Vitalik, of course. If you try to start a new coin today, you immediately get shut down by the government or you get captured by regulators, by banks, or by venture capitalists, or you're just part of this insider group who is selling your coin to other people outside of it. It was very different when Satoshi did this because he was really the first one to do it. And Bitcoin was able to grow under the, under the radar. It didn't have a group of insiders um, fixing things and making sure that they profited at the expense of people outside the, the protocol. So this is what other coins do. They do a huge pre-mine and slowly dump on retail. The, the nice thing about Bitcoin though, it's not issued by a corporation. It's not issued by a foundation. It's not venture capital coin or VC coin. As we said, no pre-mine, fixed maximum supply of 21 million coins. A lot have been lost, so the, the actual number is much lower than that, which means Bitcoin is even more scarce. And here's the other thing, you can create your own coin that has a fixed maximum supply. You could say, I'm gonna make Bitcoin 2.0 and it has a max supply of, of 10 million coins, so it's even more scarce. But the thing is, you would have to do it with a pre-mine and you would never be able to get anyone to follow you along. You'd, you'd either have to do with a pre-mine or you'd have to fork Bitcoin. And we saw how that worked with Bitcoin Cash. But the really important thing is that Bitcoin has this credible forward monetary policy. It has never changed. You get a, you get a, new, uh, a new supply of Bitcoin pushed out into the market every approximately 10 minutes on average when the blocks are mined. And then you have this four-year halving cycle. And it's been a very stable system. It hasn't been fiddled with. Like Ethereum is constantly being hard forked and fiddled with. Of course, Ethereum has the problem of its centralized leadership as well, as well as a very large pre-mine. The, the other thing about Bitcoin, it's neutral money. It's secured by proof of work, has the highest hash rate of any cryptocurrency in the world. And it's also the thing about Bitcoin, it's not just the technology, which is fairly uh, it's fairly unremarkable. What's remarkable is Satoshi put all these different cool things together, like proof of work with various other cryptographic things. But really what makes Bitcoin so interesting and so stable is you have, there's that, there's that meme where you have the three guys in the room all pointing guns at each other's heads. This is sort of what you have with Bitcoin. You have this uneasy truce between the nodes, the miners, the devs, the exchanges, the wallets, the merchants, etc. And they all have to work together. No one has the upper hand if anyone does have the upper hand, I would say it's the full nodes because they can continue to enforce the consensus rules. Um, and of course, Bitcoin Core can be changed by the devs, but if it's not accepted by the nodes and the miners, it's a it's a non-starter. So there's this really interesting uh, sort of economic balance between all the different actors in Bitcoin. Another advantage that Bitcoin has, of course, it has this long history. It's got the Lindy effect going forward. It has global brand recognition. Little kids know what Bitcoin is. Uh, senior citizens know what Bitcoin is, and everyone in between knows what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin, as we said, has this first mover advantage. In addition, it has this large market cap now, lots of liquidity that's necessary for larger investors like high net worth individuals and also institutional investors. And then finally, I want to end on something that's really important. No other cryptocurrency has the same sort of fanatical, insane hodlers that Bitcoin does. The supply of Bitcoin is slowly being vacuumed up and taken off the market forever by Bitcoin hodlers. And this is one of the things that convinced Stanley Druckenmiller to get into Bitcoin back in 2020. He was talking to the famous hedge fund manager, Paul Tudor Jones. He says, I got a call from Paul Jones and Paul and Jones told him, do you know that when Bitcoin went from 17,000 to 3,000, that 86% of the people that owned it at 17,000 never sold it. Druckenmiller admitted, this was huge in my mind. So here's something with a finite supply, 21 million coins, and 86% of the owners are religious zealots. This is of course what Bitcoin maxis are, are, are always being accused of. And to a certain extent, it's true, depending how you define religious zealot, of course. And Druckenmiller goes on to say, I mean, who the hell holds something through 17,000 to 3,000. And it turns out that none of the 
sold it. And then he mentions, of course, add, add to this the new central bank craziness phenomenon, all the money printing that we've seen over the past couple of years. So this is what makes Bitcoin special. This is why other coins don't stand a chance. They can never catch up to Bitcoin's lead. And the real problem is most of them are issued by by groups, especially by venture capitalists like um, Andreessen Horowitz, for example, and they create these new coins and then they dump them on you. This is what happened with Solana. This is what happened uh, probably with Terra Luna. Terra Luna, there's some evidence now that it could have been an exit scam where some of the founders were able to exchange their UST to Bitcoin at the end. But only Bitcoin has this immaculate conception. It has this credible monetary policy and it has this global brand, deep liquidity and history that really makes it the best candidate for the new global reserve currency. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.